All righty. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to introduce our awesome two um, speakers this evening, and I'm going to start with our co-founder, Kim. Kim was the executive director of Beyond Sports Foundation, a unique nonprofit that works with high school student athletes from underserved communities to transfer their athletic ability into a life of opportunity. In her five years as executive director, Kim grew BSF from one of one facility to three tutoring centers, transformed the brand, diversified funding streams, modernized board governance, procured an AmeriCorps grant, and tripled annual budget. During her tenure, 89% of BSF students matriculated to four-year universities on athletic scholarships. Ken serves as the on the advisory council for Loyola University Chicago, a business leadership hub comprised of the foremost leaders in social impact, enterprise, and responsibility in Chicago. In 1987, Kim was the first female student athlete in California to play on the male varsity athletic teams, basketball and baseball. She's also the co-founder of Honest Game. And then we have Jean. Jean has more than 26 years of experience in the industry with the majority of that time spent coaching at the college level. Jean is currently the director and administrator for administration, excuse me, director of scouting and administration for the New York Knicks. Jean leads scouts in both preparation and evaluation for new NBA prospects, draft workouts, NBA draft, two-way and exhibit 10 potentials, development projects, summer league, and background gathering, and, a, and background gathering towards building a championship caliber franchise. Prior to this role, Jean was a director of amateur scouting for Sacramento Kings of the NBA and served as the head coach of the Royal State Hermosillo. How did I do with that, Jean? Hermosillo, a Mexican professional basketball team based in Hermosillo, Sonora. Jean led the, the Royals, Royals de Hermosillo to the CIBA Copa Finals and was named the CIBA Copa Coach of the Year in 2017. Jean played college basketball, basketball at the University of Illinois under head coach Lou Henson. We are excited to have you both and begin this discussion. Thank you so much, Shanae. Um, hi, everybody, and people will be trickling in again. Thank you again, Shanae. Uh, Jean, so excited to talk to you today. We're going to talk about what it takes to play, to play basketball and in college and beyond. And I know there's tremendous interest here. So first and foremost, thank you for your time. You have a wealth of experience. I think that was like a whole page of your background. So we are so grateful to have you um, here today. It's my pleasure to be here and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Very happy to be here. So well, let's kick it off right away. Um, one of the things for the audience here um, that really makes it special besides Gene being involved in the in, in Honest Game and, and really being an advisor to us, um, Gene has a personal story and a background that beside being in college, but also as a parent, a father, um, and his own son and his basketball, um, his basketball journey that I think is important to share. So the first question I'm gonna ask, and for everybody here in the audience, um, I think it's important to also be sharing these stories because um, they're important stories and they're also cautionary stories. And it's why I think Gene, I won't speak for him, but was interested in getting involved with Honest Game. So the first question, Gene, is can you share a little bit of experience as a parent um, on your own son, son's journey to play college ball? Sure. Um, I think that it's, it's really important to have involvement uh, from a parent or guardian or someone that has uh, uh, each one of these potential student athletes that has their best interest. Uh, and that was my, my job uh, as, as, as my son's father, of course. Uh, and so we knew he had the potential uh, at, you know, going into high school to play uh, division one, division two, whatever it was, whatever level uh, to, to participate in college athletics. And so having had that experience of, over the, the years of, 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 you know, of preparing guys to, to play at the intercollegiate level, um, I took it upon myself to make sure I got with his counselor uh, and tried to set up a, 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 a roadmap for him from freshman through his senior year to, to prepare him for um, uh, his initial eligibility, which at, at that time would have been 16 core classes, uh, a uh, he had to take the ACT or SAT, uh, have a corresponding test score uh, according to the sliding scale. Uh, of course, the, the ACT, SAT is, is not 
sort of part of it anymore, but that was, that's how it was back then. So we had a, a, a roadmap, so to speak, um, or at least I thought, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, so we, we went through the process. He, uh, we enrolled him in classes and, and uh, he got through and I would try to you know, make sure his grades were okay. He was, you know, Dean's List and, 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 and uh, honor roll and all that. So it was, it, the grades weren't, weren't a problem. Um, but we got to probably about midway through his sophomore year, going into his junior year, uh, and went back and I was looking at the 48H, which is uh, is the uh, the listing for uh, each each individual high school. They, they, they have a list of courses that correspond to classes that are accepted by the NCAA uh, as, as, as part of the initial eligibility. Uh, and come to find out that one of the courses was not on the 48H. And so that put him behind uh, uh, half a credit based on what our, our, our roadmap was in, in, in English, which uh, you have to have four years of English. So uh, <laughs> right there, we were behind the eight ball. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it was my fault because I didn't, uh, I didn't check it before. Uh, it was his fault because he didn't check it before. Uh, and then, you know, his, his counselor was just doing what, what she thought was, was her job and, and was, was putting him in courses that corresponded with, with whatever his schedule was and so on and so forth. So anyway, the cautionary tale there is to make sure that, that you, you set a roadmap, uh, but you cross check uh, that, roadmap, that roadmap based on the 48H, based on uh, knowing what the, the requirements are to become a, 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 a division one, division two, uh, uh, division three athlete at the NCAA level. So, I mean, we got it back on track, uh, but that's a cautionary tale to say, you have to start immediately uh, prior to enrollment uh, in order to make sure that you put yourself on the right track. So you're not scrambling to, uh, to take courses uh, toward the end of your your school, and when 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 classes are probably a lot a lot harder, uh, and and you know you got all kinds of things going on. You got senior this, senior that. You got senioritis. Uh, you may not want to take certain courses, but uh, the cautionary tale is just to make sure that that as a student athlete, that you you advocate for yourself first and foremost. Uh, as a student, you have to take ownership in in, in what your journey is. Uh, and I say that going, you know, beyond college, um, but take ownership in your, in your own journey, uh, and getting with your counselors, checking the 48 H and, and asking questions, uh, as a parent, as a guardian, as, as an advocate, uh, I, I, I implore everyone to make sure that they are involved and they start asking questions. Will this be acceptable, uh, you know, uh, to the, uh, it's, it's, it's not the clearinghouse anymore. It's the, um, What's, what, what is El eligible? It's the eligibility center. Yeah, right. this is acceptable at the eligibility center. Uh, you know, it, it, is he going to have to? Can he take courses uh, prior to school? Do this, does this do these courses count prior to his initial enrollment into high school? Uh, can he take courses afterwards? You know, how many courses can he take if he goes to, to a post grad institution? I, I encourage people to ask questions. Uh, upon questions, upon questions, and there's no such thing as a as a as a, as a stupid question or or an, or a wrong question. The the wrong thing to do, uh, or the not so smart thing to do, is to not ask questions. So I love that story, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, Jean, if you can just sort of elaborate on this. I think there's a perception out there, um, just among families, that my kid has good grades, my son, my daughter has good grades, so I don't have to worry about eligibility. And I think if you can kind of shed a little light on that from your experience, having a son that was on the Dean's list and still found himself in a situation where he was a half a credit short. Yeah. Um, I think that is a very important, I think it demystifies, um, you know, I think, you know, we want everybody to know, as you said, to own your journey. Sure. And, and what, if you can sort of, and, you, and as a scout as well, I mean, I, you just have so a wealth of knowledge in the sector. So just share a little bit about that. I mean, do good grades mean eligibility and, and, and kind of demystify that a bit? Am I still there? You still have me here? You are here, Gene. I got gotcha. you. I'm sorry, because I can't, I, my, something just happened with my screen. Um, well, as it relates to uh, just my story with, with, with my son, um, you know, again, he had good grades. And the idea was that, okay, you make sure you maintain your grades. We, you know, I, I didn't play that and his mother didn't play that either. Uh, and so 
when it came down to finding out that he was going to be that half, a, and, and we still had time, but when it came down to, to, to seeing him being that half a credit short based on what our timeline was, um, <laughs> it, it didn't matter that he had, you know, a 3.5 or 3.6 or whatever it was, it, it, it meant that he was off track and would have been a half of, uh, he would have been at 15 and a half core classes as opposed to 16. And so, uh, there's nothing wrong with getting help. And I think that, that in general, uh, we all have to make sure that we are okay with getting help. Uh, and, and that's one of the smartest things you can do is to, is to get help or ask for help or, uh, or lean on somebody when, when you don't have an expertise or something. And, and, and I had the expertise, which was the crazy thing. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's so much better to, to lean on somebody who knows and who can, who can cross check or who can ask the tough questions or who can challenge you to go ask the tough questions. And so, uh, again, great grades are important, of course, but having, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not even just having the grades, it's, it's having a, a breadth of knowledge uh, that can help you uh, circumnavigate, you know, what, what, what have been crazy waters uh, in general for people, but then, you know, you, you can eliminate some of the waves and some of the bumps and some of the obstacles by uh, employing, em, employing somebody to, to help you get through. Again, it's, it, the grades are good and, and, and you have to have good grades and you should have good grades, uh, but it's, it's about the knowledge, it's about the working knowledge, and it's about having people that can help you circ circumnavigate the, uh, the murky waters of, of, of uh, initial eligibility. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think uh, I think people, as we said, don't realize that every class doesn't count. No. Every class is not NCAA accredited, right? And no. so you've got to be have certain grades in specific classes, and that's sort of the story of your son. And and also, even with someone like you, who's an expert, a veteran in this, this can happen. Yeah. And I think that's the the cautionary tale, and just for everybody to own their journey. And then even even in 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 any, in some cases too. Um, and, and, and you're exactly right. You can have a 3.8, but if you don't have a, a you know a 3.8 in your core classes, then your your, your core is going to be at it might be at a 3.2, or if, if you have a three two three it might your core your core GPA may be a 2.5 or 2.4, uh, because you have all these other classes, these tertiary classes who you know that 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 don't that won't get counted in that six in those 16 core classes. So um, it, it's critical. It's critical to 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 have the knowledge and knowledge base, or to have somebody or an entity uh, like an honest game that can help you uh, figure it out, or, or be more proactive as opposed to reactive. Right. I think I I, I know we're going to move on to the college stuff, and it's going to be exciting. But I I love this story. First of all, I love that you shared it. Thank you for kind of sharing that your your journey, your son's journey, and even someone as 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 a veteran like you. But I also um, want everybody to know out there that um, not every class counts. And I think Gene just said that. And so just to make sure that if you're behind, like Gene's son found himself a half a credit, he was lucky. He could catch up. But not everybody can. Depends on how far behind you are. And so um, I think Gene's story was a cautionary tale and the end result was positive. But just for everybody out there, be proactive, not reactive, as, as Gene said. Um, yeah. So love that you shared that. Yeah, the biggest thing is, is getting a hold of the 48H uh, and, and making sure that, that everything matches. Uh, that's one of the biggest keys is, is you know, because the wording is different. Uh, there may be a different uh, terminology used that, that and, and you have to go in and, and ask questions. Is this the same class that's on here? Why isn't this class on here? Or can we petition the NCAA to, to, uh, or the NCAA to get this class added? Uh, and so there, there, there are different avenues, but again, trying to match those things up and having a working knowledge of that 48H and the courses that are on that 48H and, and the corresponding uh, uh, types of courses is, is, is important. Right, no, I think that's, uh, that's incredibly important. And can you play, can we take it to the next level as well, um, moving on also from your son's story and sort of thinking about how does academics play into college recruiting? <laughs> It, it's, uh, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, whew. one of the first things that, that we, I would ask a high school coach, you know, you know, he can play so on and so forth. Okay. I was great, you know, uh, and if I get a, well, or, you know, he's a, then I start to 
worry about it because, you know, I may want to go recruit this, this terrific student athlete, um, but all things being equal with, with talent, if there's a player over here who has good grades or who, who is, who is on track or who is, uh, who is driven to, 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 to become academically inclined, uh, or, you know, you don't have to be the smartest, but if you work hard or you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to wind up, you know, being okay. Uh, so if, if, if there's a difference between recruiting this kid and another kid who doesn't really like going to class or doesn't, uh, you know, appreciate the academic component of it, then I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'll still, I'll still keep this guy hot over here, but I'm going to go recruit the, recruit the daylights out of this other kid. Uh, because I, I know that he'll, he'll have a, a better chance of being successful uh, uh, because that, there will be certain requirements when he, when he got to, gets to college. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's all a part of your character too, is, is you know, do you want to make yourself better? Do you want to get better? Do you improve yourself? Uh, so that, that it's kind of all encompassing. Uh, and so <laughs> when you ask about how important grades are, it, it, it's, it's really important. That's really, that's, that's great. I, I also wonder if it was a situation where you really wanted to re recruit a student athlete and, um, you know, it wasn't an issue necessarily of grades, but eligibility was an issue or a potential issue. How, how did, how did you handle that? And how do you think college coaches in general handle that? You know, it's interesting um, because when I was at University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, we had a couple of student athletes who wound up having uh, who, I had a kid who was salutatorian. He was, you know, he had a high GPA, but his, his, his corresponding test score was low. So he, he came to us as a, as a partial qualifier. Uh, and um, I mean, it really depends on what your philosophy is as a, as a, as a basketball staff, what your scholarship situations are, what your institutional uh, philosophies are. Um, but <laughs> you know, of course you start early, you try to get it, you try to get transcripts as early as possible to try to, to, to do a, a workup on them and to make a determination as to where, you know, what their, what their track is and what their progress will be uh, and try to say, okay, these are, these are the grades you're going to need. And these are the courses that you're going to need in order to, uh, to, uh, to become eligible uh, and, and to, to pass that initial eligibility test. Um, so, I would get a transcript as quickly as possible to try to determine whether somebody was, was, was first of all, admissible to our institution, but then secondly, uh, to try to make a determination of how uh, I could help them um, figure out how to make sure they were on track to be eligible. Some people were really easy. Uh, other people were really, really uh, challenging to say the least. Um, because again, you know, you, you were, you were, you, back then it was, again, you were worried about a test score uh, and a corresponding GPA. Uh, again, those, 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 those uh, uh, um, qualifications are different right about now, but still in all, uh, it's critical to make sure that you, uh, you, you, you set yourself up academically to, to, to be in a better position. Because if you don't, I'm sorry, Gene, if you don't set yourself up academically, Am I correct in saying as a former college coach that it's a risk for the college coach? Oh, it's a huge risk. Um, you know, it, and, and our job is to make sure that we bring young men in and, and lift them up and, and try to help uh, fill in some of the gaps. Uh, you know, they may, be, they may be missing something here or there, but our job is to, is to bring them in and kind of help to mold them uh, and continue what their parents did into molding them into, um, into productive citizens, into positive uh, humans, uh, and where they can go out and 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 you know have a career, or have a job, and raise and have a family, what have you, if they want to. Uh, so you know, ultimately, uh, again, it's it's just trying to make sure that you you're doing what you you're supposed to do, and and you can't have too many guys that are risky because you only, you only have so much bandwidth as a, as a, as a, as a coach, as a coaching staff. And so, you know, you don't want to be spinning a plate over here and then have to go spin another plate over here. And then, you know, by the way, this spin this plate's here. Now you got to spin this plate, but by the way, this plate is about to fall. And <laughs> uh, it, 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 it winds up being uh, the law of diminishing returns. And so 
you have to make sure that you, you, you bring in guys that, that as many guys that are low risk as possible. And then you can pour yourself into somebody who, who had, who is low risk or is high risk, uh, to help. Cause sometimes all, all somebody needs is an opportunity, uh, and somebody that's pouring into them. And so the more, the more low risk guys you have, the more opportunities you have to help somebody who's, who's higher risk, who just needs that opportunity, who's in, who needs that boost, um, in order to help get them over the hump, so to speak. Right, and ac- I mean, having academic eligibility issues or academics just being a, uh, not a strong student is a risk, yeah. correct? Yeah, it is, it is. But the, I mean, but there are opportunities there. It's just, uh, it, 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 you, you take away opportunities for yourself. Um, the, the, you take away oppor- more opportunities for yourself if you, if you have, uh, uh, if you don't have better grades, I mean that's that's the bottom line. The better your grades are, the the the, the wider your, your 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 variety of schools that you'll be able to go to. The wider your choices will be. Right. Can you speak also real quickly? I've worked with so many students in the past, and there is I've seen this not all the way across the board, but definitely where students maybe student athletes may be worried about their transcript. Maybe they transferred schools, whatever it may be, so they don't share it uh, readily. And I want to speak from a college coach's perspective. Um, we've already talked about the importance of academic eligibility, academics in general, and how without those, without, without those things, you can kind of put yourself in a riskier position and create more risk for the college coach. But can you speak to the, the idea of sharing a transcript, even if a student or a family is nervous or they're waiting for certain grades? <laughs> it's kind of like, um, you know, you, not going to the doctor. You want to go to the doctor so you can figure out what may be ailing you quicker, sooner rather than later. Um, and so we, and a lot of times people do hold on the transcripts because they, they, they just want to hold on and they won't have anything getting about getting out about somebody's grades or they want to wait to try to, you know, see what they can do with themselves. But the, the, the sooner we have the information, the quicker we can make an assessment and the quicker we can write, get, get the ship, uh, write it and, and point it in the right direction, uh, or the train on the right track or whatever, whatever you, you want to use. Um, the sooner, the sooner, the sooner a transcript is in the hands of a, of a college coach, uh, the better opportunity you will have for them to help you uh, figure out if you're on the right path or not. If you are, then good. Uh, then that, then you're full speed ahead with the recruitment. Uh, if not, then then we can help you determine what you know how to get on that path and whether you want to be recruited by by a particular school because if you don't want to do it if you if, if we can put you in the right position but you don't want to or you're not willing to or or whatever the, the circumstance is then you know we can save everybody some time and and uh and, and angst no i think that's great okay the next question is is an interesting one um that i don't really that i don't know the answer to and i would love to hear your feedback on which is what part do academics play, earlier academics, whether it's high school, whatever it may be, into the NBA scouting process? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Um, we, we gather so much background and intel on prospects, it's amazing. Um, and when I, when, I got, when I moved from the college side to the professional side, um, you know, I knew how much we did in background at the, at the high school level, I mean, at the college level, but it is uh, when you're investing uh, millions of dollars in, into to players and prospects um, in trying to determine uh, what somebody's, uh, what they're made of, what their metal is, uh, going back and talking to a high school counselor, to uh, a dean, to, uh, to an AAU coach, to a travel team coach, to uh, academic advisors that that plays a huge I mean it plays a big role um again we have so many data points on prospects uh at the professional level that you you you'd be really really surprised at the number of people that we talk to and the layer the number of layers that we peel back and going back to to academic comp- performance is is a part of that uh I, as a matter of fact I was just talking to a um to a, I won't reveal the prospect because he's in this, in this year's draft, but uh, I was talking to a, a, a prospect's academic counselor in high school, and we were talking about his performance, you know, starting from, from, from start to finish till he went to a prep school. So, um, yeah, we, it, it's, 
you, you, you may think that you're getting away with something or you're sliding, you know, you, you're being slick and saying, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'll be fine later on. Well, no, later on is right now. Um, and if, if you're, if you're the caliber player that can make it to the NBA, then we'll find out the type of student you are and the type of uh, person you are and, and, uh, and what, and what you're made of, because again, we're, we're not going to just throw around uh, uh, millions of dollars without having some background on you. And, and, you know, there may be some risk, uh, but it, it's up to us to calculate how much risk we're going to involve. And, and how, you know, it, it depends on your academic performance may cost you $5 million because you're, you're, you're more of a risk than a player who started off, you know, and, and did a great job uh, initially academically. So, um, and I just, you know, that's just a, a, an arbitrary number, but you could cost yourself some money uh, in the long run if, uh, you know, if you don't start off on the right foot. <clears throat> so not even, even as far back as high school. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That is amazing. And we talk about, you know, your past following you, but making those proactive steps um, and we all make mistakes, right? But how do you rectify them? How do you own them? Um, and, just like, right. Just go ahead. No, that's, that's a part of it. And, and so, you know, if somebody starts off, you know, as, as with a, whatever, say X GPA, but it, it, it goes from X GPA to X, you know, X 0.5 GP or X, you know, X plus one GPA, um, or it, it, as opposed to just staying static and then at the end, just, you know, going up just because they needed grades to, to become eligible, what have you, uh, that plays, a, that plays a role. You know, it, there's a gradual improvement and, and we, we see that, that there's sort of, sort of um, uh, a stick to itiveness and, and um, uh, a level of, uh, of understanding that you, you have to, to, to gradually get better and, and to, you know, you may not be a great student, but if you work at it again, uh, and, 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 and show a level of determination and perseverance to become a better student, then that, that, that demonstrates to us that you have a certain drive to become better, uh, as opposed to just waiting and say, well, here, let me turn it on at the end when I need it. Right. I, I love that. Can you also speak, taking academics, we know that obviously, you know, owning up to stuff and um, being able to sort of face the facts that, you know, maybe there is eligibility issues, academic issues, but you're willing to sort of work on them really touches on character. Well, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, again, it, it just, it, it's just a part of, of, of somebody knowing, knowing your strengths and weaknesses and having the willingness to uh, admit that you have a, a weakness and saying, yeah, hey, I'm not strong in this area, but I, I have the, the will uh, and the desire to get better or to improve in these areas. It's just like, and so it, 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 that speaks to, and we can extrapolate and say, okay, if they, if they weren't great as a student, but they showed a level of will and determination to become better students, then that it's probably gonna, gonna bleed into the court and it's gonna bleed into them, um, you know, wanting to get into the gym. And if they, uh, you know, had a bad shooting game or if they turned the ball over, or if they, you know, didn't cut off the baseline, they, will, they might wanna, they, they'll, 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 they will probably wanna get into the film room or get onto the court or uh, sit down and have a talk with the coach to try to figure out how to get, get better. And so, uh, you know, that does speak to, to somebody's, uh, to their makeup and to their character as to, to, to how, uh, how coachable you are or how willing you are to take criticism or how willing you are to, to again, own your mistakes uh, and, and, and uh, not make excuses, uh, try to figure out the best way to to not make those same mistakes again. So that's great. And so when you think about academics, you think about character, which we touched on. When you think of, are there other attributes that are important for the the group here to hear the parents and students that are on this? As far as other qualities that both college coaches look for, or do they differ? And also in the pros. No, I mean it's it, it's pretty much the same. It's just you know. Um, it, it, Character and makeup and, and, and what your personality is like is, is important. Um, now, there isn't one specific personality type that we look for, but it's up to us to make sure that we figure out what somebody's personality is uh, so that we can know how to, how to coach them or how to, um, or, or what makes them work or how they learn. Um, uh, some people may be more visual. Some people may, may, uh, need to see things on the court. Some people may, may be better 
uh, at, at reading things and writing things. And, and, you know, some people may have certain limitations those in, 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 in those ways. So um, uh, there, there's so many different layers to, to how we, we choose players. And I think that's at, that's at every level, um, but especially at the NBA level, because uh, again, it, it's such a huge investment uh, and you only have so many chances to draft somebody or sign a free agent or uh, what have you. So we have to make sure we peel back layers to determine uh, what makes a, a, a player tick, uh, what their background is, you know, where do they come from? Um, you know, what's their injury history? I mean, I just, there's so many different, different aspects of it and so many data points that we collect to try to figure out, you know, what this particular person's path may be because your data points in our, in our system uh, will, will determine your path. Well, that's awesome. And I think that uh, the next question I think is uh, thinking about this as a parent myself, as a parent yourself, as Shanae being a parent and all the parents and coaches that are on here today, um, what, what role, do you think that parents should play having a being a parent yourself, but also having been a college coach uh, and now in the pros. So kind of taking it across the, the broad spectrum, um, they want to be supportive, but you know, how much is too supportive? How is that viewed by the recruiting community? Um, and, you know, do you have any feelings about, you know, parents on this call or coaches, you know, about self-advocacy and just sort of wrapping that all up? Well, um, Everybody loves their children, period. Uh, we all know that. Uh, no one understand that as in, in the recruiting game, um, you're also being recruited as well. And so um, if a college coach comes to a game and they see you in the stands, you know, uh, coaching up your kid on the, on the court uh, or, or being a little bit overzealous or yelling at the coach or, uh, yelling at the other team, what have you, um, that plays a role. And so I think it's important for parents, of course, to, to cheer for you, to you support your children. Uh, you, I mean, uh, it, 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 there's nothing like a, as, a, as, a, as a student athlete looking in the stands and seeing your people there. Uh, there's nothing like that. Your, 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 your mother, your father, your parents, I mean, your guardian, whoever it is uh, that supports you, there's nothing like having that support. Um, but I think that, that, uh, and you have to be there for them and you have to be able to, to help them figure out the, the murky waters of, of recruiting or, or whatever it is. Um, but there's also a line, uh, that parents have to, to make sure that they, you know, prepare your children to get out there and, and, and advocate for themselves, uh, and try not to, and not to try not to don't live uh, your life and try to live vicariously through them. Uh, and I think that a lot of times, uh, you know, we see our children going on to be successful and say, well, that, you know, I wish I would have been that way, whatever it is, and just uh, let them be them and, and try to help them, try to uh, push them in the right direction, try to help guide them, make sure they don't uh, fall in a landmine, so to speak, but also, you know, allow them to help figure out the process themselves because ultimately they're the ones who will be, uh, going to that particular institution for for however many years, and, and they'll be the one. They will be the ones that that get that get the, that degree, and uh, uh, it's up to to us to help guide them, uh, but prepare them to make the decision uh, for themselves because it, it's it's their existence and not ours. But that's that's beautifully said. Uh, but I'm going to have to zone in on one thing you said because it was really terrific. Um, and I want, and I'm, and I, and I, it's helpful for everyone to understand. And I think I'm, the words you used were, remember when we're recruiting your son or daughter, we're, we're you know, we're looking at you too. Oh, for as sure. Far as recruiting. And so if you could just sort of talk to that a little bit, cause I think it's super important. It's not, it's hard to know what that line is, but, and you, and you may have a story or two, or maybe not. Uh, but I think that it's helpful for people to understand, you know, what as a college coach, what are you looking for their role to be and how can they be the most supportive um, and not really jeopardize an opportunity for their son or daughter to get recruited. Yeah, you know, I think it, it, it's it, it's a thin line, uh, of course, because you want to make sure again you, that, that everything is you you want to make sure that everything is perfect for your child. Uh, and in this in the world, it, nothing will turn out perfectly. Period. Uh, and and sports uh, and, and involvement in, in, in athletics is a microcosm for the world. 
And so it's up to, to us to, to be there again, to support them and for us to help them figure it out, uh, in my opinion. And so, you know, I even, even think about my, my, my son is, is, is in junior college now. He's a first year, he's a freshman junior college. And so his playing time has been up and down. And uh, some games he may play two minutes, some games he may tw play 20 minutes or what have you. And so, um, you know, he called, we talk about it. And I'd say, okay, well, what, what could you di do differently? What'd you, what'd you do well, so on and so forth. Okay, then let's then go figure it out. Uh, and as 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 a as a parent, I, I want to know what's going on in the coach's mind, it, it, especially as a coach, because I'm thinking like, okay, I, I know I know what I was thinking when I was coaching ex, ex players so on and so forth, but I want to know. But I have to pull myself back and and rein myself in to say, you know what, that's up to him to kind of figure out on his own. Um, uh, with my guidance, uh, and he's got to learn how to get through adversity or how to deal with success. Uh, because as, as sure as I'm sitting in this chair right here, I'm, you're gonna experience some adversity in your life. And so if you have support in a safe environment where they can go out and learn how to get through adversity, that's one of the best ways to teach our children how to, how to make it through you know, life, because life throws all kinds of things at you. Uh, and it, it, it's not gonna just be not playing or you know, missing a couple of shots. It's going to be well, you know. Guess what? I I I lost my job, or you know, I got to choose between two different jobs, or whatever it is. Or you know, I, I failed the test. How do I get better at this test? So life is going to throw different things at you. And I think sports, uh, it, it's kind of is a microcosm of of, of teaching our kids um, how to uh, get through adversity. And parents, I, I, I again support your kids, love your kids up, clap for them, cheer for them, uh, all of that. Uh, but but. I think the biggest thing is to, is to allow them to learn how to fail, so to speak, in a safe environment, uh, but also how to pick themselves up from that, that, that obstacle, that failure, that whatever it is, uh, so that they can be better. Uh, and, you know, they can go and learn how to, how to you know, start a business. If the, if the business fails, they can you know, learn how to pick themselves up and, and start another business or, you know, uh, or whatever it is. If you have a job and, and whatever it is in life, I think it, it, it starts right here with athletics. That's why, that's why I think, think athletics and, and participation in athletics is so critical toward uh, our, 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 our community and, and, and helping people become successful. So uh, I could, I, we're actually going to be in a, in a little bit, we're going to run out of time and have to go move to Q&A because I could talk to you forever. Um, you have some really like incredible insight. I mean, we haven't even talked about the G League. We haven't talked, we saw some questions in here about prep school. So I'm going to ask like one or two more. I'm back. I'll do another one. Let's do it. Let's do it. So um, thank you for sharing that insight on, you know, the role of parents um, and kind of how it impacts recruiting and how sometimes it's hard to take your own vision of your own self um, and let your kid be their own person. So um, I, think the, I think you said that that beautifully. Um, so one or one, one more question or so, and then we'll go to Q&A, maybe one or two. Actually, I actually have two questions. The first one is, can you talk about the purpose of the G League? Um, and what is the pathway to get there? And how is it working today? Um, the purpose of the G League uh, right now, and it's evolved over the course of time. Um, right now, it is it, 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 it's the 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 minor league for the NBA, um, and it is a it is a system set up for uh, for NBA prospects to or well, it, it's set up for for player development first and foremost for NBA teams to, to choose talent, to bring in, bring in free agents or use their rookies or, or second or third year players, uh, assign them to the G League to develop. Uh, it's also used for rehab assignments. Uh, so a player that may be hurt. I know that, uh, matter of fact, when I was coaching uh, the, the Knicks, a few years, the Knicks G League team several years ago, I had Amari Stoudemire on a, on a rehab assignment. Uh, so if the player gets hurt, they need to come back and get their rhythm without, and, and, and then, you know, NBA teams don't practice a whole bunch during the season. They might come and assign them to us or assign them to the G League. And, uh, you know, they may get a couple of days of practice. They may play a game, uh, but just to get their, 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 their basketball legs back, just to get a rhythm, just to kind of get a sweat and to see how their, their injury is, is, is coming along. Um, and then, you know, it's, it, it, and then it, it's, a, it's a way for players who, uh, 
maybe just on the cusp of, of getting into the NBA. It's a way for them to get uh, NBA experience or NBA-like experience uh, and then to propel them to go make money overseas or internationally. Uh, and so it's, it's it, it, you know, there are players that I know that spent plenty of time in the G League uh, and used to be the D League who didn't quite get there or got a 10-day call-up or whatever it was uh, played a summer league, played on a summer league team, went to training camp, got some money for training camp, uh, but they parlayed that into a, a, a long career overseas. And so the NBA and the G League, uh, that's not the end of it. Uh, I, I, I encourage people all the time that if you don't quite make it here, uh, go experience the world. If you can go and play in France or go and play in, in Italy or go play in the Euro League or go play in, in, in Australia, uh, you know, use this basketball thing. Uh, and, 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 you know, somebody I used to hear, use basketball, don't, last, don't let basketball use you. Uh, there's so many opportunities for people to play and participate, uh, you know, across the globe. And so that's a way that, that the G League has been utilized as well uh, to kind of just help propel people uh, into a professional career that may not necessarily be in the NBA. Now you asked so if it's two, worth it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead, Gene. Yeah, finish, yeah. No, no, uh, I was going to ask you just because I couldn't help but ask, I, I want to hear the rest, but I couldn't help but have ask because I was a, a former basketball player and and so was Shanae Howard on here. Is there, uh, do you think there'll ever be a female G League? That's a great question. That's a great question. And truthfully, I, I think there should be. Uh, and with the way that, that, with the direction that we're going, um, with I, I, I hope that salaries will begin to get better for, for the w, WNBA players. So, uh, so, so that, that uh, they don't have to go play overseas and they can kind of have an off season, have time to rest, what have you, uh, and, 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 you know, experience the same thing that, that NBA players do. But I think that ultimately it's about opportunities uh, for women and for girls to participate. And I hope that, that, that we can get there eventually. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for development, not just of, of players, but of, of people to get into coaching or to get into front office work, uh, you know, people come up from video work and what have you. So it's, it's, a, it's a great way for any and everybody to have, have better opportunities. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think that the WNBA is, 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 is growing in popularity uh, and, and the NBA is, is, is coming around. So hopefully. Well, I love that. Uh, before we open it up for Q&A, um, one more question that I think you're like a testament of this is that uh, anybody who's worked with student athletes, who has a student athlete, it's not uncommon for when sport ends or if your playing time ends, um, wanting to stay in the, in the industry, wanting yeah. to stay in the sector, feeling that, you know, that was a loss, sort of all the energy and excitement and all the incredible attributes we get from sport. So what advice do you have? Um, I mean, I'm Shanae and I both still work in sport. This is sports technology that we have at Honest Game. And obviously clearly you do. So if you have some advice for, for parents out there and also for students uh, wanting to say, okay, I, I can still be part of this. It may look different. Cool. Um, and the, the ball does stop bouncing at some point in time for everybody. Uh, Father time is undefeated. Uh, my suggestion is, um, one, is if you're passionate about it, then study it. Um, whatever, whatever sports you're in, uh, it, 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 whatever it is, if it's sport, if it's volleyball, if it's football, if it's basketball, whatever it is, then study it. Watch it uh, and, and really you know, read books about it. Um, I got a, I've got a huge library of books upstairs and, and, and over half of them are, are basketball related. Uh, and not just about, about mechanical aspect of it, but just about maybe philosophy, uh, different coaches and what have you, uh, philosophies of different coaches, what have you. Um, then make sure that, that, that people know that this is what your interest is. Uh, if people know that you're interested in, 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 in following up your career uh, with staying in the industry, make sure people know it. One of the, I remember uh, when I was graduating from the University of Illinois, I went to Coach Collins, Coach Jimmy Collins, uh, who was an assistant coach for us at Illinois. And I, I went up to him and I said, when you get your first head coaching job, I want to come work for you. And uh, he said, you want to work for me? And I'm like, yeah. 
you know, I, I, I respect you. I want to work for you. I see, I see what you do. And I want to, I want to, I want to be just like you. And lo and behold, when I was, was it three years later, I went to graduate school, was in grad school for, uh, for a year and a half. And I finished my grad program and, and he got the head coaching job at university of Lawrence, Chicago. And, and, you know, I saw him at the final four. I, I shadowed him at the final four. Uh, and I said, I'm going to come work for you. And he said, you know what? I'm going to call you in two weeks. He called me three weeks later and he offered me a job and the rest was history. So I think that if people know that you're interested, you find out, um, you find out about clinics, you go to clinics, you go to any sort of opportunities you have to learn, uh, and grow in the business. You network, 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 and you, 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 you try to find somebody that, that is in the position that you want to be in. You find other people who are hungry like you. Uh, you surround yourself with other people that 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 are hungry like you. Uh, I remember I was at a at a at a at a conference one day, and the athletic director it was Gene De De Filippo, who was the, the athletic director at Boston College. He said, "Find five people, you know, today, and who are in a position that you want to be in, or that whatever it is, and you write them." And then, you know, the next day you find another five people or whatever it is, or you know, in another week you find another five people and you'd be surprised at the people that would write you back, but then nurture those relationships and stay in touch with those people because those relationships can help further your growth. And if they, they, they get to know you, they see you, they see your work ethic. And ultimately you do have to know, you, all, you always have to know what you're doing and you always have to work hard and prove that you can do the work. That's the bottom line. If you can't do the work, then you can't have the job. But if somebody sees it, and they might see just what it's, you know what that Kim she she works her tail off and she's staying in touch with me. You know, let me let me let me talk to her about this job. Or let I've got a friend, I've got a buddy who who is hiring uh, for whatever position. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know send send Kim's resume to, to that person and to him or her and uh, see if if they'd be interested. That's how it works. I think that uh, what I love about what you said um, and and kind of to wrap this up is that what I heard you say, sort of across character, across academics, um, across even your own son's story as a parent is really, as a student, the importance of advocating and going after for, going after what you want, you know, Absolutely. going after and, and studying it and being, you know, very meaningfully studying it. So it's, whether it's how you play the game, how you perform in the classroom, you know, how you approach your career, um, what you're passionate about and that, but that the past matters as well. Yeah. But you, you know, you can rectify that, but the past matters. And so, you know, pay heed to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's it, your story, your story is going to be interesting to somebody, but make sure that story is, is a story of, of, you know, of redemption and trying to, you know, get yourself on the right path or make sure that story is, is, is full of you, you know, having to overcome different obstacles or whatever it is, or just fighting and clawing to, to, to do, you know, even the, the, the littlest of, you know, the smallest thing on, on the court to the biggest thing on the court, whatever it is, just make sure that that story is about you working and, and setting your nose to the grindstone and, and being somebody that, 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 that a person who's going to do some hiring can count on. Well, I, I really, and I know we all do, um, I can't tell you how, how grateful we are for this. Your knowledge, your experience, your wisdom, your vulnerability to share your story, to share your son's story. So before we, first of all, thank you. My, it's my pleasure. It, it's my privilege. It's my privilege and honor, I, you know, to be able to talk to, to, to students and student athletes and parents and to share. Uh, and that's what this is all about. I think if, if I don't share, then I'd be doing, doing uh, a disservice to the people who helped me. That's, it's about paying it forward, right? So thank you so much, Gene. And I'm going to turn it over to Shanae. I know we've got a bunch of questions that we, we've been hearing. So I'm going to mm -hmm. turn it over to Shanae just to make sure we get some, some last things uh, answered from parents in the audience. Cool. Awesome. So thank you again, Jean. And I'm just going to throw some out there, give you some quick answers. And you can still write some in the chat if you have some. So um, first question is, can you explain the pros and cons of going to prep school versus JUCO? <laughs> you know what? It, it, it really just depends. Um, there are different factors in, in, that go into, into deciding to go to, to either. Um, one is cost, uh, a prep school, depending on, on, on where it is, who it is, uh, might cost money. And so you have, you have to be prepared to, to potentially pay for prep school. Uh, I, you know, some people can go to prep school and they, and it's, it's paid for, 
others can go go in and they get a partial or others go and it's fully fully take it's fully fully uh, uh scholarship so uh cost is one um junior college uh typically they give scholarships for junior college uh and again my my, my son is, is as a matter of fact they're playing at hutch uh tomorrow uh, on wednesday as a matter of fact in the national tournament so he he's at, he's on scholarship at at his junior college uh and usually the path had been um and to date with the transfer portals really it's different these days uh usually the path was, is, was if you if you were not on track to become an, an initial uh qualifier then you would take the junior college path and have to go two years and then go on to a four-year institution now uh <laughs> it's a little bit tr it's a tr it's trickier now because um college coaches want older players now that's the bottom line and unless you're one of those you know high level players uh five star guys then usually they're going to go through the transfer portal or or what have you to try to get guys so it might be beneficial to go to junior college as a qualifier and play a play for a year and then have three years of eligibility plus a potential redshirt year um but again it, it depends on what your what your preference is because uh you know, if you go to prep school, then you you have four years to play and of end that, that, that red shirt year. So you have four, five years to play four. If you go to junior college it, as a qualifier, you'd have four years to four years to play three. So again, it depends on what your what your what your financial situation is, what your personal situation is, and and uh, how how you how well you feel you can come in and, and make an impact to to either go right away to, to play in that, in that four year institution after, after you're in junior college, or if you want to wait two years, it, it just, it, it just varies. But, uh, <laughs> I say all that just, <laughs> it's, 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 it's complex. Um, it's a complex, yeah. very complex, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a very good option. Those are two very, very good options. Yeah. We can, we can have a whole panel just on that discussion, uh, in addition to the transfer portal, <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. Um, it, well, the next follow-up question would be: If you were recruiting hypothetically, would you prefer a prep school athlete or a junior college athlete, and why? Well, it, again, it would really depend. Uh, if if uh, it would depend on so many different factors, because you know my roster management. Uh, it would depend on you know what level junior college or what level prep school that this particular mm -hmm. went to. Um, it might depend on my relationship with 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 either one of the coaches of, of that uh, those particular institutions. Uh, I may know somebody better, and they may have a better idea of, of this particular player uh, than, than than a relationship I had with the, the, this other coach, and they may not have a, a, a good a feel. So it just it really really depends. Um, again, coaches want older, so so going to prep school or junior college, it makes you a year older. Uh, mm -hmm that you can go there and, and have productivity and, and get better. Thank you. Um, is it better to specialize in one sport or do college coaches look at multi-sport athletes? You know, it's funny. I like multi-sport multi sport, sport athletes, especially football players. Um, uh, football players uh, have, a, have a certain level of toughness and greediness about them that a lot of uh, coaches love. Matter of fact, our, our general manager, uh, if a guy plays football, he kind of raises his head up a little bit. Uh, so just just a little bit of insight there. I, I think that 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 multi multi sport athletes uh, are attractive um, for for a bunch of different reasons, but specifically for me and and our organization football. And probably. One more question. Um, let me see. I got to think of a good one so that I mean, so that I've got a little bit of time. I, I know I want to respect everybody else's time, but I've got a little bit. So is it better to play overseas after college for to better your chances in the NBA? <sighs> um, I think that if you have an opportunity to go overseas uh, and to play in a good league and to make, make decent money, uh, you do that, and then you know you can always come back and play summer league, or you you have a certain level of success overseas. There are plenty of players that come back uh, from from a, a a successful professional stint after two or three years in in the in the uh, 
in Europe or wherever it is, uh, or in, in Australia, and bounce back to the NBA. Uh, we've, got, we've got professional scouts over there. Right? We've we got two guys in Europe right now uh, that live there and scout wow. over there. So most teams have, have, have somebody in Europe on their staff uh, that, that scouts and scours those leagues for, uh, for players. That's awesome. And so our last one says, what are the emerging positions within the sports industry? You, you dabbled on it when you talked with Kim about um, beyond the court and different positions. So what are some of the emerging positions? You mean positions that, that people kind of use to get to kind of circumnavigate? Um, you know what? Uh, video is a good way to get in. Uh, if you're in the video room, that means you're studying the game. That means you're watching plenty of basketball. Uh, so there's a huge knowledge base there. Um, uh, being an intern uh, is, is critical, I think, uh, to learning different aspects of of, uh, of an organization. So if you, you find an internship uh, with a G League team or with an NBA team, uh, it, it, that, that in itself is a way to, to uh, cement yourself in, in somebody's mind as a worker, somebody who has the potential to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, on a scouting staff or a coordinator or, or a director or, you know, potential GM or what have you. Uh, so those are a couple of different avenues there, but video, is, is important. I think interning is, is important. Uh, and then uh, coaching at the, at, the, uh, at the travel level, the AAU level is, is also a way that you can kind of get yourself into college coaching or, uh, or, or, or uh, administration as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering those questions and for being with us today. Kim, I'm going to um, give it back to you to conclude us for this evening. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. Thank you everybody for tuning in this evening. Uh, Jean, we can't tell you how much, how important it is to share your story and also wisdom and knowledge. And yeah, I liked Sinead's ideas about coming back to the transfer portal, junior college. We'll be, well, hopefully we'll be back everybody with Jean Cross again soon. So thank you so much again. It's my, my pleasure again. And, and I'm, I'm, I, let's do this again. We can do this again. Well, it was a lot, it was a lot of fun talking to you. So thanks Jean. And uh, again, uh, have a great night and uh, safe travels, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate everybody. Thank you. Thank you.